So good morning to the guys uh, online. It's great to have you, in a sense, with us as well. And, uh, and obviously, good morning to you guys. We are still in Colossians. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Colossians chapter 2. I think we'll, we, we might have it on the screen. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to cover um, a, a big chunk of it today. Colossians 2, verse 6 to 23. And um, I want you to, I never do this. But I want you to say two phrases with me before we start. Okay, so the first phrase is, in him. And the other one is, with him. Okay, in Christ, with Christ. There we go. Okay, let's kick off. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus our Lord, continue to live in him. I love it when you do that. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude, with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and receptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all of the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, we also have been circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by hands of men, praise the Lord, but with a circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, we are raised with him, through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made your life, you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not, anyone, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regards to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These things are shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone, therefore, who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you have died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you still submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These things are destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body. But however, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What an incredible portion. So in this portion, there's a, a couple of do's and don'ts. Paul is, has done uh, the greeting. He has um, laid a platform of, of theology, spoke of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mystery. And now he's going to come to some, some do's and don'ts. Because of all of this, therefore do this and don't do that. It's rather simple. So we'll kick off again in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. So that just as you have received Christ, do, it's one of the do's, do continue to live in him. So how did we, just as we received him, do continue to live in him? As you received him, continue to live in him. How did we receive him in the first place? So according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, this is how we received him. It is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. It's not of, yourself, of, of yourselves or from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast. And so therefore, he's encouraging them to, just as they've started to continue, as you've received him, to continue now to live in him, 
by grace, through faith, not works. Don't allow yourself, now that you've started well, to be turned aside by Jewish teachers or by philosophers or teachers of philosophy who dish up a whole lot of hot pufferies devoid completely of any substance, devoid completely of Christ. If it is not in him, what, it is, all, what is it all about? It's over seven. It's still a do. Do stay rooted in him, strengthened in your faith. As you were taught, he said, overflowing with thankfulness. He's encouraging now to go deeper and to go higher, but so that their faith can grow, but not grow in anything else but into Christ. And so therefore to stay rooted and be rooted in Christ, not in anything else. He taught them a very simple, true, pure gospel without any additional human bells and whistles required. Paul's gospel was a simple gospel. You don't have to figure it out with, with a whole lot of sweat pouring down your face. It's not one of those moments in the movie when, when shall I cut the black wire or the red wire? And, and have you noticed, you know, although they, they, they really stress and, and it's black or red, they always get the right one somehow. Somehow, it always happens that whichever one they cut, the bomb doesn't go off anyway. So why do they stress? Haven't they seen the movies before? In any event, the way Paul teaches, he says, I've given you the, a simply pure, a simple and a pure gospel without any other human bells and whistles. You don't need to add to it. No, start and continue to live this gospel, this pure, radically simple gospel, but with great gratitude. Because it is wrapped up in, in such simplicity. Let's move on to verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. There's a, a story that goes around, and you might have heard it, that um, as the family got ready for a Sunday um, lunch, uh, the lady cut off the end of, of the roast. You, you know the story, or the end of the leg. And um, the daughter said, but why do we do that? Said, no, it's the way it, it should be done. This is the way you, you cook Sunday lunch. You have to cut off that piece. She said, but, but why? It doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't look bad or anything. It's not sinewy. There's no. She said, well, I'm not exactly sure, but um, my mom used to do it, so I'm going to phone her. So she phoned mom to find out, and mom said, Oh, yes, 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 yeah. Yeah, you have to cut off that piece. Yes, mom, but, but why? She says, I'm actually not sure, but I know my mother did it, and she taught me how to do it. So fortunately, Omar is still alive. So they got hold of Omar, of Omar Khoiki, and they got, and she said, oh, yes, the piece we had to cut off. She says, no, you don't actually have to cut it off, but back in that day, the casserole, only fitted a leg that size. So we always had to cut off that one piece to make it fit the casserole. So we, and so this was handed down from generation to generation as absolute law. This is how you do Sunday lunch. You have to cut off that piece. Otherwise you might just poison the entire family. In the meantime, they found a bigger casserole and money well, yeah. So Paul says, uh, he's now addressing it directly. He says, don't, don't run the risk of losing your freedom by some grand-sounding but empty theories, the kind that has been like this, practiced for decades. It's been passed on as truth, as absolutely vital in order to please God. But in the end, it's empty. It's worthless traditions. It's legalistic rituals. It's superstitions. It's a bunch of religious old wives' tales. Another translation puts us at, as follows. Everything of God gets expressed in him so that we can see and hear him clearly. Everything in God, of, of God, gets expressed in him so that we can see and hear him clearly. You do not need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. How do you like that? 
You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of him and the emptiness of the entire universe without him. I love that. Let's move on to verse 9 to 10. We're covering great ground. For because in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And then the and, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over all the, of these powers. I love it that Paul, when there's a new theory, when there's a new question, when there's a new heresy, doesn't go to try and find a new answer. He simply refers them back to the old answer. He simply takes them back to the established truth, to the truth, to the only truth. And so he, he doesn't try and come up with a, uh, a new answer. He simply refers them back to what he's already told them. So this verse, in Christ, the fullness of the day delivers in bodily form. This is almost exactly the wording we had in Colossians 1, verse 19. Colossians 1, verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. So what we need to realize is there's no more of God, there's no extra of God to be discovered for us outside of Christ. In Christ, in him, there is the fullness, the complete, the perfect, accurate description and representation of the Father. There is no more of God outside of what we find in Christ. He is the full, complete, perfect, and eternal representation of the Father. And last week, when John was preaching, how many of you had hamburgers in the week, by the way? It seemed to be quite interesting how that got stuck in our heads. In any event, when, when he was sharing on Christ in you, the, the hope of glory. This is the wonderful mystery. We find that Christ lives in us. The glorious riches of the mystery. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we have that all the fullness of God lives in Christ. And he, Christ, in us through the Spirit. The fullness of our hope of glory. All of the Father, all of the, the deity, all of, the, all of God in Christ, and all of Christ through the Spirit in us. What more do we need? It's an absolutely beautiful portion of Scripture. Now, Paul is going to give them two more building blocks. I do sound quite loud this morning. He gives them two more building blocks, and... Um, and with these two, he, he's, he's, he's basically packing a fire here. He can, and, and he's preparing uh, quite a bonfire. And on this bonfire, he is going to sacrifice three unholy cows. And so we have recently uh, put in one of those wood burners. And I've found that if you have enough of a bed of coals, then you can put in quite a log. Um, you, you, can, you can put in, uh, yeah, something, the, yeah, a, a sizable log, but you have to start and build up a serious bit of coals. And this is what, what Paul is doing here. He is building up a, 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 a wonderful bonfire. He's creating an altar. He's packing the steak. And on this, not the, the, the eating steak, the, 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 the fire steak, on this stake, he's about to sacrifice three serious holy cows. Okay, let's look at two more logs that he's adding. He says, in him you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by hands of men, but done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. Remember that circumcision was the sign of the old covenant, the sign that they belonged to the people of Abram. They belonged to the people of, they, they were the people of God. And this is not required in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, we find that baptism is the, the sign that we are the people of God. It's the sign of the New Covenant with God, a covenant which is by faith. And so, 
Whether Peter, when, when the crowd came out to Peter, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, and they cried out and they said, Brothers, what shall we do in response to the outpouring of the Spirit? Peter replied to them in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Be baptized into Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you also will receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, repent and be baptized, not repent and be circumcised. So that's the, the one log. And then the last log is, he says, because when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave your sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that stood against us and was opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross, and then having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, in order to be accused of something, in order to be found guilty of something, you have to be accused of something. In order to be accused of something, that needs some backing. It needs to be against the law. You cannot accuse me of breathing. It's okay. And so, sometimes you, you read interesting laws. I couldn't remember this morning, but I think it was in Hong Kong, it might still be, that it was illegal to chew bubble gum in public. Singapore, okay. So it still is. See? You can believe me, I'm a pastor. So, so imagine, it's, it's one of those wonderful laws. You know, yeah, it's perfectly fine to be chewing bubble gum. It's, for, for some people, it, they feel like a complete gymnast when they can chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. I sometimes feel like one of them. In any event, but, but it's, you, you have to, there has to be a law. Here, there's no law. Nobody can stop you on the street and say, you are chewing bubble gum. I sense that. I'm going to do a citizen's arrest. <laughs> and so what happened here is in order for the evil one to be able to accuse us, to, for us to be found guilty of our sins, they needed to be the law. And the law had, was there, so he had everything that he needed. He had, he had sinful men, and he had the law, and he could accuse us rightfully so. But up until this point, it says, when we were dead in our sins, in the uncircumcision of our hearts, God made us alive with Christ. Because he forgave our sins, how was that possible? Because he canceled the written code, he took away by fulfilling in Christ, through Christ, the law that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, when Jesus fulfilled the law on the cross. When he came off the cross, he was able to take the law that stood against us, turn it around, and nail it to the bloodstained cross because it was now fulfilled. And when it was fulfilled, there was no longer a law on which the accuser could stand to accuse us in order to have us declared guilty because in him it was fulfilled and in him we are forgiven, and in him we have freedom. That's something to celebrate. And so it just reminded me again that um, the, the perfection of the cross, the perfection of, of what took place, how it was fulfilled, the law fulfilled beautifully, perfectly. And one of the things that Jesus had in mind when he said it is finished on the cross. The legal basis to hold them guilty has been taken away. It is finished. At last time, he nailed it to the cross. Remember when we read something similar in Colossians 1, verse 22? It says that, Now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present us holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. 
in Christ. Holy in His sight. Without blemish. Free from any accusation. For there is no longer an unfulfilled law. Isn't that something you just you want to jump out of your seat? Who saw uh, The Incredibles? Fairly early in, in the movie, whatever his name was, invented rocket boots. Do you remember that? It's completely irrelevant, but in any event, it, when you read something like that, you, you, you feel like you want to put on rocket boots and... I don't know, never mind. I want to. So this is it. We are holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation in Christ. I want to quickly take the five points that Paul has used to build this bonfire. These were the five things. Firstly, he said, you received the full gospel, now live it. There, there isn't another surprise, there isn't another chapter to this gospel. You have received the fullness of the gospel, now live it. And this is what, what you've received. Four things. The fullness of God lives in Christ. There is no more of God outside of Christ. The fullness of God lives in Christ. The fullness of Christ lives in you by His Spirit. Christ, the hope of glory. Then your old sinful nature has died with Christ, and you have been made alive with Christ through faith, which is demonstrated by your baptism. Fourthly, you've been therefore forgiven by Jesus, by him fulfilling the requirements of the law, which he then nailed to the cross, leaving the accuser powerless without any basis whatsoever to bring any form of accusation against you. So now there is a fire that is roaring. And now he says, bring for once thy quickies. And so he says, therefore, since we have this monstrous bonfire, therefore, do not let anyone judge you on what you eat or drink or religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These things are shadows of what was to come. They've all been fulfilled in Christ. So, Oh, how the, how the self-righteous love to point out and point fingers and, 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 and the accuser point things out in ourselves. But we can take him to the bonfire. And, and the, the first thing that went was diets and days. I am, um, yeah, well, don't take it too literally, but um, diets and days. First things that, that went into this, this bonfire. I went up in smoke because what you eat has just as much power to defile you than observing some pilgrimage has the power to make you holy. Outside of Christ, it is completely meaningless. The second cow then, he says, do not let anyone who delights himself in, in false humility and the worship of, of angels disqualify you for the prize because they go into great detail about what they've seen and the mysteries and all the rest of it. But they've lost connection with the head. Sometimes they've lost their heads. They've replaced it with a, a tambourine and a tie-dye kaftan. Okay, so, sorry, let's stick to the notes. Angel worship... And a whole lot of visions, completely devoid of Christ, followed into the flames. Only that which comes from the head, Jesus Christ, can hold us together and cause us to grow. The third one, the last cow, he says, because since you have died with Christ, and you've also died to the basic principles of this world, why do you still submit to it? as if they are still relevant, as if, as if there's still any worth or, or value in it. Do not handle, do not touch, oh, do not touch, do not taste. He says all of these things were, were, were destined to perish. They're based on human commands and, and teachings. See, some sects of the day, I was so nervous about saying that word, but I got it right. 
would deny themselves any form of tasty food. They would only eat dry, coarse bread and only drink water only after sunset. So they'd wait for sunset to whip out their coarse bread and their water. And if they were touched by anyone not belonging to their sect, they would feel most defiled and they would scrub themselves very severely to rid them of the defilement and the uncleanness. What utter rubbish. The Pharisees, the Essenes, and the Gnostics made it all about the outward appearances and the outward rules instead of the inward conviction of the heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes us from the inside outward. It doesn't attempt to change the inside by working on us from the outside. Recently, we, we had uh, Anthony Noble here. Some of you might know him, might have seen him do one of his paintings or do some pottery. And um, he did a, a quick pottery demonstration. I don't want to give too much away because I actually would love him to come and do it for us one morning. Um, in the end, on his, at his potter's wheel, he was starting to, to make a, a pot. And um, he basically made a, let's call it a vase, this, this high. Said, but now he wants to turn this into a, a, a what shall we call it, a pot? A bowl, a bowl, a dish. And um, I said, but, but how to do that? And as he touched it, obviously, as the more he touched it from the outside, the more the thing kind of wobbled and folded inward. So he said, the way to work on the outside is to go inside. And he went inward with, with his hands and just kind of, push it out, and whoop, by magic, this dish simply formed. So, but, but take note, in order to shape the outside, you have to work from the inside. It was, such a, it was so profound, so simple, but so visual. That's it for this morning. However, I think it would be good for us to Take a moment to pause at that bonfire. You'll remember the logs. I don't have to repeat them, and I'm, I'm sure maybe that, that's some of the things that the, the life groups will touch on in the week. The question is, what are we? See it here. What, what are we to put onto the bonfire? Are there any cows that, that we've come up with that should go to the fire? It, it, the question almost seems to me out of place because we don't do angel worship. We do eat bacon, especially near. <laughs> we do seafood, even bottom feeders and prawns, all these forbidden delicacies. We even go to the beach on Sundays. I'm not too sure about you, but I, I still... If a button comes off on a Sunday, I come and walk from Monday. Because when I grew up, whoo, whoo, whoo. needlework on a Sunday, I, I, I think it's blasphemous to actually say it. Jy steek die naald in die jyrese oog. So that's still, maybe next year, we'll get there. But in any event, so, so which one of, you know, the, the, the what I want us to get is that although we've moved on, the, the, the bait changes, but the hook remains. The bait may change, but the hook remains. And so what have we culturally or religiously or just simply gradually been putting next to or even above the Lord Jesus? What are we, what traditions, what, what empty stuff, what baggage are we carrying with that we need to just throw onto that bonfire and make sure that we stay to the pure, simple, perfect, complete gospel? 
May it perhaps be our children in this age, our careers, comfort, finance, leisure activities, cultural demands, or maybe family traditions. Ons doen het soe, ons snu die boutse sterf af. Has our lack of religion, which is a good thing, has our lack of religion turned into a lack of discipline? Where not having a fixed time with God, or a fixed time in the Word of God, or a fixed time of prayer, gradually became no time with God, no time in the Word, no time in prayer, or no time of fellowship. Do you see, and this is something that we, we need to really hear, Christ fulfilled the law so that we can be free, not so that we can become lawless. Christ fulfilled the law so that we can be free of the law, not lawless. So I want to, I want to ask, can we take 30 seconds? Just close your eyes where you are. Lord, as we, as we consider this, this bonfire of truth, where we understand that there is no more of God outside of Christ, that the fullness of Christ also dwells within us once we've received you and we've been baptized into you and we've received your Holy Spirit, you dwell in us completely. That our sinful nature has died with you and that we've been buried with you by faith. And we've also then been raised up with you. Therefore, we have been forgiven because you have fulfilled the full requirements. You have paid the full price for our sins. Our sins have been punished. We know and understand that sin cannot be forgiven. Sin has to be punished. But sinners can be forgiven because sin has been punished in Jesus Christ on the cross, fulfilling the demands of punishment, fulfilling the wrath of God in and on Jesus Christ, in our place and on our behalf, perfectly, completely, and eternally. By grace, by faith, we are reminded of this. We receive it and we accept it yet again. And on this roaring bonfire of the truth of the gospel, Holy Spirit, will you right now reveal to us what it is that we individually, perhaps as couples or families, but for us as individuals, what do we need to throw onto that bonfire of truth? And let it be consumed once and for all. Lord, we thank you that there is no accusation against us. Thank you, Lord, that when your Holy Spirit comes and reminds us or points out things, it is not in order to condemn us, but to bring conviction so that we can take that and throw it into the roaring bonfire of the gospel of Jesus Christ that purifies us through this process of sanctification. So let us rejoice and live in the true grace and the freedom of his gospel. Grace and freedom that always points to him and always leads to him. Never into any form of decadence. Let us rejoice and live in the true gospel. The true grace and freedom of that gospel. Grace and 
and freedom that point and lead to Him. In Him, for Him, for eternity. Amen.